Greeting Council by Fenelon. Four, on prayer and the principal exercises of piety. One, true prayer is only another name for the love of God. Its excellency does not consist in the multitudes of words. For our Father knows what things we have need of before we ask Him. The true prayer is that of the heart, and the heart prays only for what it desires. To pray then is to desire, but to desire what God would have us desire. He who asks what he does not from the bottom of his heart desire is mistaken. He thinks that he prays. Let him spend days in reciting prayers, in meditation, or in inciting himself to pious exercises. He prays not once truly. If he really desires not the things he pretends to ask. Two, oh, how few there are who pray! How few are there who desire what is truly good? Crosses, external, internal humiliation, renouncement of our own wills, the death of self, and establishment of God's throne upon the ruins of self-love. These are indeed good. Not to desire these is not to pray. To desire them seriously, soberly, constantly, and with reference to all the details of life. This is a true prayer. Not to desire them, yet to suppose we pray, is an illusion, like that of the wretched who dreams himself happy. Alas, how many souls fall asleep, and of a imagined desire for perfection in the midst of a host of voluntary imperfections, have never yet entered this true prayer of the heart. It's in reference to this that the Saint Augustine says, "He that loves little, prays little; he that loves much, prays much." Two. On the other hand, in the heart in which the true love of God, that the true desire exists, never ceases to pray. Love, hate. In the bottom of the soul, prays without ceasing, even when the minds are drawn another way. God continually beholds the desire which He has Himself implanted in the soul, but He may at times be unconscious of existence. His heart is touched by it; it ceaselessly attracts His mercy. It is then the spirit which, according to Saint Paul, helps our infirmities and makes its intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Romans eight twenty six. Four. Love desires of God that He would give us what we need, and that He would have a less regard to our frailty than to the purity of our intention. It even covers over our trifling defects and purifies us like a consuming fire. He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Romans eight twenty seven. For we knew not what we should pray for as we ought, and in our ignorance, frequently request what would be injurious. We should like. Horror of a devotion, these insensible joys and apparent perfections, which would assert to nourish within us the life itself, and a confidence in our own strength, the love leads us on, abandons us to all the operations of grace, put us entirely at the disposal of God's will, as us prepare us, prepares us. For all his sacred designs, five.
then we were all things and yet nothing. For God gave us precisely what we should have desired to ask. We will whatever he wills, and only that. Thus, the state contains all prayer is the work of the heart, which includes all desire. The spirit prays within us for those worthy things which the spirit itself wills to give us. Even we are occupied with outward things, and our thought drawn off by the providential engagements of our position, we still carry within us a constantly burning fire, which not only cannot be extinguished, but nourishes the sacred prayer. It's like a, a lamp, continually lighted before the throne of God. I sleep, but my heart wakes. Song of Solomon. Verse 2, blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he comes, shall find watching. Book 12, 37, 6. The two principal points of attention necessary for the preservation of this constant spirit of prayer, which unite us with God, we must continually seek to cherish it. We must avoid everything that tends to make us lose it. In order to cherish it, we should pursue a rapid course of reading. We must have appointed seasons of secret prayer and frequent states of recollection during the day. We should make use of retirement when we feel the need of it or when it is advised by those of greater experience and unite in the ordinances appropriate to our condition, we should greatly fear and be exceedingly cautious to avoid all things that have a tendency to make us lose this state of prayer. Thus we should decline those worldly occupations and associates with dissipate this mind, pleasures which excite the passion and everything calculated to awaken the love of the world and those old inclinations that have caused us so much trouble. There is an infinity of detail. There is infinity detail in these two heads. General directions only can be given because each individual case presents the features peculiar to the self. Seven. We should choose those works for reading, which instruct us in our duty and in our thoughts, which while we, while they point out the greenest God, teaches us what is our duty to Him, and how very far we are from performing it. Not those barren productions which melt and sentimentalize the heart. The tree must bear fruit. We are only judge the life of the root by its fecundity. Fecundity. Strange word. Let me study a little bit. That is ability to produce abundant of offspring or new growth. Fertility. For quantity. Eight. The first effect of our sincere love is the earnest desire to know all that we ought to do to grandify the object of our affection. Any other desire is a proof that we love ourselves under a pretense of loving God, that we are seeking an empty and deceitful consolation in him, that we would use God as instrument to our pleasure, instead of sacrificing that for his glory. God forbid that his children should so love him, should so, so love him, cause what it may, 
we must both know and do without reservation what he requires of us. Nine. Seasons of a secret prayer must be regulated by the nature, the disposition, the conditions, and the inward impulse of each individual. Meditation is not prayer, but it's its necessary foundation. It brings to mind the truths which God has revealed. We should be conversant, not only with all the mysteries of Jesus Christ and the truths of his gospel, but also with everything the author operates in us for our regeneration. We should be colored and penetrated by them as a wool is by the dye. Ten. So familiar should they become to us that the, the in consequence of seeing them at all times and ever near to us, we may acquire the habit of forming no judgment except in their light, that they may be to us our only guide in matters of all practice. At the rays of sun, are our only light in matters of perception. When this truth is at once, as it were, incorporated in us, then it is that our praying begins to be real and fruitful. After that point, it was but the shadow. We thought we had penetrated the inmost recesses of the gospel, when we had barely set the foot upon the west bell, all our most tender and lively, living feelings, all our firmest resolutions, all our clearest and farthest ways about the rough and the shapeless mass from which God would hew in us. His likeness. Eleven. When his uh, celestial rays begin to shine within us, then we see in the true light. And there is no truth to which we don't instantaneously assent, as we admit, without any process of reasoning, the splendor of the sun the moment we behold in the rising being. Our union with God must be the result of our faithfulness in doing and suffering all His will. 12. Our meditations should become every day deeper and more interior. I see deeper because by frequent and a humble meditation upon God's truth, we penetrate the Father and the Father in search of new treasures. And more interior because as we think more and more to enter into these truths, they also descend to penetrate the worst substance of our soul. That is that the simple word that goes the Father, the whole servant. Thirteen. The very thing which had been foodlessly and coldly heard a hundred times before now nourished the soul with a hidden manner, having an infinite variety of flavors for days of in, for days in succession. And let's be aware too of a ceasing to meditate upon truths which have heretofore been blessed to us to land the remains and nourishment in them, so long as they yet yield us anything, is a certain sign that we still need their ministration. We derive instructions from them without receiving any precise or distinct impression. There is an indescribable something that, which helps us more than all our reasoning. To behold the truth, we love it and repose upon it. It strengthens the soul and detaches us from ourselves. 
then dwell upon it in peace as long as possible. 14. As to the manner of meditation, it should not be subtle, nor composed of long reasoning, simple, and natural reflection derived immediately from the subject of our thoughts are all that is required. We need take a few truths, meditate upon this without hurry, without effort, without seeking for far-fetched reflections. Every truth should be considered with reference to its practical bearing. Receive it without employing all means to put it physically in practice, at whatever cost. Its desire to hold the truth in unrighteousness. Romans 1 18. It's a resistance to the truth impressed upon us, and of course, to the Holy Spirit. This is the most terrible of all unfaithfulness. 15. As to a method in prayer, each one must be guided by his own spirit. Those who find themselves profited in using a strict method do not depart from it, but those who can so define, confine themselves may make use of their own mode without seizing the respect that which have been useful to many and which so many pious and experienced persons have a highly recommended a method is intended to assist if it be found to embarrass instead of assisting the sooner it is discarded the better 15. the most natural mode at the first is take a book and to cease reading whenever feels so inclined by the passage upon which we engage and uh, whenever and no longer minister to our interior nourishment to begin with. As a general rule, these those truths which we highly rel relish and which share the degree of practical light upon the things which we are required to give up for God are leading of divine grace which we should follow without hesitation. The spirit blows where it blisted it. John 3, 8. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 2 Corinthians 3, 17. In the course of time, the proportion of reflection and reasoning will diminish. As that of tender feelings, affecting views and desires, will increase as we become sufficiently instructed and convinced by the Holy Spirit. The heart is satisfied, nourished, warmed, set on fire. A word only will give it employment for a long time. 17. Finally, the increase of prayer is indicated by increase of a simplicity and steadiness in our views. A great multitude of objects and considerations feel no longer necessary. Our intercourse with God resembles that with a friend. The first there are a thousand things to be told that is made to be asked. But after time, this diminish, while the pleasure of being together does not. Everything has been said, but the satisfaction of seeing each other, of feeling that one is near the other, or reposing the enjoyment of pure and sweet friendship, can be felt without the conversation. The silence is eloquent and mutually understood. Each feels that the other is in perfect sympathy with him, and that their two hearts are insensibly, insensibly pulled one into the other, and constituted by the one. 18. Thus is 
designing for our communion with God becomes a simple and familiar union, far beyond the need for words. But let it be remembered that God Himself must alone institute this prayer within us. Nothing would be more rash or more dangerous than to dare to tempt it ourselves. We must suffer ourselves to be led step by step by someone conversant in the ways of God, who may lay the immovable foundation of the correct teaching that is the complete death of self in everything. Nineteen, as regard retirement and tending upon ordinances, we must be governed. By the advice of someone in whom we have confidence, our own necessity, the effect produced upon us, and many other circumstances, are to be taken into consideration. Twenty. Our leisure, that our needs, must regulate our retirement. Our needs, because it is with the soul as with the body. When we can no longer work without nourishment, we must take it. We shall otherwise be in danger of fainting. Our leisure, because this absolute necessity of food exceeded, we must attend to duty before we seek enjoyment in spiritual exercises. The man who has a public duty that spend the time appropriate to them in meditating in retirement. Would miss of God while he was seeking to be united with him, united to him. True union with God is to do His will without ceasing, in spite of all our natural disinclinations, and in every duty of life, however disagreeable or modified. Twenty-one. As a precautions against wandering, we must avoid close and intimate intercourse with those who are not the pirates, especially who have been before led astray by the infectious maxims. They will open our wounds afresh. They have a secret correspondence deep in our soul. They there are soft. Insulating counselor who is always ready to blind and deceive us. Twenty-two. Would you judge of a man? Says the spirit. Proverbs thirteen twenty. Observe who are his companions. Who can he who loves God and who loves nothing except in and for God? He enjoys the intimate companionship of those who neither love nor know God, and who look upon love to him as a weakness. Can a heart full of God, with some support of his own frailty, ever rest and be at ease with those who have no feeling in common with it, but are ever seeking to rob it of its treasure? Their delight. The pleasures which faith is a source are incompatible. Twenty-three. I'm well aware that we can't say that we all not to break with those friends to whom we are bound by the esteem of their natural amiability, by their services, by the tie of a sincere friendship. Or by the regard consequent upon mutual good offices, friends whom we have treated with a certain familiarity and confidence will be wounded to the quick were we to separate from them entirely. We must gently and imperceptibly diminish our intercourse with them without abruptly declaring our alteration. Of a sentiment, we must see them in private, distinguish them from our less intimate friends, and confide to them the matter in which their integrity 
and the friendship he never thought to give us good advice and to think with us. Also, a reason for so thinking are more pure and elevated than theirs. In short, we may continue to serve them and to manifest all the tensions of a cordial friendship without suffering our hearts to be embarrassed by them. 24. How perilous is our state without this precaution? If we do not, from the first, boldly adopt all measures to render our piety entirely free and independent of our unregenerated friends, is threatened with a speedy downfall. If a man surrounded by such companions be of a yielding disposition of inflammable, pre- inflammable passions, it is certain that his friends, even the best intentioned ones, will lead him astray. They may be good, honest, faithful, and possess of all those qualities which render friendship perfect in the eyes of the world, though for him they are infected. And their uh, amiability only increases the danger. Those who have not this estimable character should be sacrificed at once. Blessed are we when a sacrifice that ought to cost us so little may award to give us so precious a security for our internal salvation. 25. Not only then should we be exceedingly careful whom we will see, but we must always reserve the necessary time that we must see God alone in prayer. Those who have stations of importance to fill have generally so many indispensable duties to perform that without the greatest care in the management of their time, nor will be left to be alone with God, when they have ever so little inclination for dissipation, the hours that belong to God and their neighbor disappear altogether. We must be firm in observing our roles. This strictness seems excessive, but without it, everything falls into confusion. We become dissipated, relax, and lose strength. We insensibly separate from God, surrender ourselves to all our pleasures, and only then begin to perceive that we have wandered. It is almost hopeless to think of endeavoring to return. Purr, purr. This is our only safety. Blessed be God, which has not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. Psalm 116, 20. And to be faithful in prayer, it is indispensable that we should dispose all the employment of the day with the a regularity, nothing can disturb.